Um, it's a great honor to be here, and I cannot. I, I think I've never been in a most beautiful, uh, more beautiful place. And you know, today competing with the sound of the waves is just such an incredible setting to give a lecture. I hope you'll stay focused on here, but please feel free to mingle around or interrupt me if, uh, if I'm going on too fast or you would like to uh, know more details. I would like to thank this amazing institution uh, for hosting me here. This is a residency program for artists and, and scholars. Uh, in my case, I'm kind of both. I uh, have a foot in contemporary art, but also have background in history of Islamic um, art and architecture. Um, and um, the staff and the director of uh, Shangri-La have been really tremendously generous in supporting my research and also, I mean, everything um, that one wants to do here. So I would like to acknowledge uh, Deborah Pope, um, the previous director who um, initially invited me to come here. Um, she's been also such a great supporter of my work. And now Conrad, uh, who is, has taken on this place and uh, taking in new directions. I wish you all the best. I know the, the Shangri lies in the best hands. Uh, Carol, Don, and Bethany, thank you so much for um, allowing me to you know, do all my work here and helping me along the way with every possible uh, little detail. Thank you. So uh, over the past decade, um, the field of art has been transformed by convergence of different cultural and disciplinary perspectives in globally networked society, uh, new forms of different of cultural mobility and emergent communication technologies, as well as increased recognition of culture's agency in addressing global conflicts and crises. Uh, I'm working across different um, cultural territories and also disciplines uh, in addressing um, um, changes that are also affecting the field of Islamic art and architecture. And my work in, that I will be showing you today is on the umbrella of what I call Future Heritage Studio. It's uh, always a group of people collaborating with me in different projects. Um, explores the way in which we can link contemporary art, cultural heritage in uh, local sites, and then also uh, new technologies to address the world's many ills. This talk is structured in uh, three parts. Um, I will start with um, the ongoing um, political developments in light of the developments and destructions going on in Syria and other part of Islamic world to become, uh, to talk about the agency of culture in a war and uh, moments that we live in that are witnessing unprecedented destruction, uh, both in, in, in crisis in humanitarian terms, but also in cultural terms. Uh, so in this part of the lecture, I will show you a, a project that I do, did both as an academic and also in, as an artist to try uh, to see what can we do, where is it that we can as scholars and practitioners contribute um, uh, to uh, these large scale developments. I will then turn to the increasing problem of xenophobia and the rising polarization in regards to presence and visibility of Islam in the West to discuss how aesthetics um, can help mediate uh, differences between cultures and help processes of pluralization of cultural diversification um, across the world. And then in the third and last part, I zoom out to uh, global threats to culture to discuss ways in which transdisciplinary and uh, transcultural collaborations with engagement of new technologies can help um, us uh, to address uh, loss of heritage in different places. I will then conclude with an ongoing project called Memory Matrix in which I would also like to uh, invite you to uh, participate. So let me begin with um, the first question. What are the prospects of the discipline that studies art, architecture, and culture of a world that is currently undergoing unprecedented form of destruction? What is the role and agency of us cultural practitioners in addressing the pressing humanitarian crisis in a world in which every fourth person is a refugee? Here I would like to make two points. 
Uh, first, I strongly believe in the importance of our work as researchers and educators in documenting um, cultural richness of Islamic societies, preserving the evidence of existence and coexistence, and educating future generations about those aspects of history that uh, may not be suitable to contemporary interpretations of various nationalists, dictators, and religious fanatics. It is precisely that memory that is doomed for erasure that we can keep uh, from being forgotten and uh, by writing it down. Second, um, I think that even if we cannot prevent wars and cultural destruction as individuals, we have the power to support the social healing of communities in, in the long run, um, excavate and uh, reinsert that memory that was erased um, uh, through, um, through war. And here you see an image of a musician playing in the ruins of the uh, National Library of Sarajevo, the city where I come from, where people really, during the war, you know, found uh, courage to go despite the raining of grenades, go to see art exhibition, go to see uh, a concert or a theater performance, because um, being engaged in culture made um, these people different from those who shot at them. So it is really art, culture, um, that uh, makes us human and make us different from, uh, from those who, who want to uh, erase that. And it is precisely in Bosnia where I learned about the agency and the power of culture to change the world. Um, and um, this is precisely why it was targeted um, during the 1990s uh, war. I come from a place, Sarajevo, that is uh, also known as Jerusalem of Europe because you have in the close proximity uh, really 500 meters next to one another, uh, religious edifices standing from the three uh, main uh, religious groups. Uh, Catholics, um, Orthodox Christians, and Muslims have lived for centuries there side by side. And that peaceful coexistence was embodied in the cultural heritage of the region. You see this is a um, um, Bosanska Krupa, a smaller town in Bosnia, one of the many places that have a similar situation on the main square. You have a main mosque, Catholic and Orthodox church standing literally next to one another. And um, it is in the, this close proximity that we see um, evidence of coexistence that it was not only possible but also prevalent in the Balkans. And because uh, cultural heritage embodied that memory and, and that evidence uh, of that coexistence, it fell uh, um, to the victim, to nationalist extremists of all ethnic groups uh, to the different extent. During the early 90s, in 92, the war began in Bosnia, and this was one of the uh, tragic instances where culture fell uh, to attack um, of the war. The, you see here the destruction of the bridge uh, in Mostar, a famous bridge, which was a pearl of 16th century um, um, Ottoman architecture, also a symbol of uh, people living together, in this case Muslims and Catholics uh, living on two sides of, um, of the bridge. Uh, so this bridge was attacked purposely, uh, just as many other uh, cultural edifices, to kind of launch um, warfare against culture. And you would ask yourself, why would someone shoot a bridge? Why would sh someone um, target a library? Here we see the targeted burning of the National Library of Sarajevo, uh, which uh, was shot by, um, in this case, uh, Serbian forces. Um, on August 9, uh, 25 in 92, and when people started building uh, um, human chains to rescue the rare books uh, in the library, uh, they were targeted also by snipers who wanted to prevent the book saving actions. So the ashes from the library were raining on the city for days. Uh, over 300,000 books, um, rare uh, manuscripts and codices were destroyed uh, to ashes, just as many other um, archives and libraries across the country, in many of which you know, the material has never been documented or studied, so we don't even know the extent of the loss there. 
so when you ask yourself why was this important for the nationalist extremists, it was really, um, you know, when you consider uh, the bigger plan of what became known as ethnic cleansing in our war, um, was that destruction of people went hand in hand with the destruction of ma their material traces and uh, evidence of their culture. So in case of Bosnia, um, so you know the strategy of ethnic cleansing was twofold. On the one hand, people were imprisoned in concentration camp uh, or expelled from their places uh, or in their hometowns. On the other hand, um, uh, their um, culture and artifacts of, 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 of their existence have been also erased. And this is why specifically religious architecture was targeted. Mosques and churches in many places uh, have almost always been completely erased. Destruction was systematic and detailed to the extent that you know even the foundation stones would be dug out. Um, so in this process, the nationalist extremists realized that uh, you know culture can really be substitute for people. It's not only evidence that they lived there, but it's also a kind of uh, represents the social network, and it's also a kind of is a symbol of their existence, and in this case also coexistence. So in my academic work, I documented this um, destruction in Bosnia, but also tried with my work to prove that destruction was not just you know, coincidental part of warfare happening here and you have a collateral damage, but uh, um, looking at the waves of destruction in a manner and sadism on architecture to prove that this was part of the, you know, this was a tool of genocide. Um, and we see it specifically, you know, in the context of Islamic religious architecture, which is my uh, specialization, is the way artifacts and monuments were destroyed uh, went beyond, I destroy your mosque or you destroyed my church. Um, there was a certain sadism and a way of, you know, really thinking about architecture as people. So uh, buildings were mined, blown up, then uh, foundation stones were um, removed from the site, as in the case of the Alaja Mosque in Foccia, one of the most important monuments um, from the Ottoman period in eastern Bosnia, where afterwards all mosques in this part of the town were destroyed, even the foundation stones were dug out, cemeteries were dug out, uh, then all the stones were carried to unknown locations so that to prevent the reconstruction from the original material. In this case, also a kind of sad uh, mixture was found, the fragments of the mosque were mixed with the garbage heap and also with uh, uh, bones of, of um, um, mass grave on a nearby uh, water, on a nearby river, indicated somehow that in the eyes of the, those who destroyed it, you know, this was all the same. The building, the people, and garbage are all the same kind of pile of, of dirt that needed to be removed. Um, so here I would like to bring you a quote by French philosopher Ernst Renan, who uh, explains and addresses why, you know, is this kind of destruction and erasure important in processes of, uh, of warfare and, and kind of national formations as it happened in Bosnia. Forgetting, I would even go so far to say historical error is a crucial factor in the creation of a nation, which is why progress in historical studies often constitutes a danger for the principle of nationality. Indeed, historical inquiry brings to light deeds of violence which took place at the origin of all political formations, even of those whose consequences have been altogether beneficial. Unity is always affected by means of brutality. So what can we do in light of destruction like this? Um, you know, my uh, aspect of my work as a scholar was to document uh, and show what has happened. But also in the process of doing this, I discovered that often that scholarly knowledge doesn't reach people uh, in the villages, in the communities that also have something to say. Uh, so 
as I was uh, d doing my field work, I had the opportunity to interview a lot of the victims and also uh, women who uh, preserve local traditions through weaving, one of the local uh, traditional crafts. And this is a piece that I developed for um, the exhibition, one exhibition in uh, The Hague. Uh, it's called Monument in Waiting. And it's a hand-woven uh, traditional carpet um, woven by uh, women who are war survivors, like this one. Um, and you see um, the patterns of this carpet are uh, having a really strange patterns. It looks like a traditional pattern, uh, carpet, but uh, these patterns were slightly transformed. In reference to uh, what is known as Afghan war rags, after decades of violence in Afghanistan, uh, the patterns of uh, local um, carpets started transforming to include and document what's happening to the people there. So you will find Kalashnikovs and tanks and grenades being woven into these carpets. Um, this is a kind of phenomenon that goes back also to the trench art. Uh, in the First World War, people, you know, in the moments of existential crisis, they go back uh, to do something. So either you become completely insane or you you deal with the situation. And art in this context can help to transform that uh, traumatic event into something constructive. So here you see flower vases being uh, carved out of uh, um, um, grenades. So I use this idea of you know, transforming moments of death and destruction into a kind of process of reflection and documenting what's happening. So this carpet, it's an uh, unfinished carpet on the top. It tells stories, in this case, of nine mosques that were destroyed during the war. Um, and it documents different types of processes, each, this is so-called tree of life motif. Um, each branch of the tree is one mosque story. And you have information here coded uh, in terms of how it was destroyed and how it was uh, reconstructed. So you see some of the leaves are filled with yes or no. So it's a kind of coded carpet in which I have encrypted data oh, from uh, my database, which um, was building on one of my mentors' work. This is Andras Riedelmeier, the head of the Aga Khan Documentation Center at Harvard who was one of the key witnesses in the criminal tribunal in The Hague, um, working really with you know, documentation of heritage to prove uh, the cultural aspects of genocide. Uh, so I was adding to his database, at the same time adding these personal stories and kind of oral histories uh, and um, you know, stories that were not documented and, and left out of these types of documents. Um, and these range from different topics, from this is, for example, um, bird with a big foot. Forgot to tell you where are the birds. So at the end of these branches are little birds. In traditional carpet iconography, birds symbolized uh, they are messengers, they are carriers of stories and also souls from this world to the world after. So this bird with a big foot is a story of, of teleportation. Sarajevo city being raided in uh, 19th century, and a woman is being kidnapped, and she dreams uh, uh, in her dream a sheikh, an Islamic mystic, who tells her, if you want to go home, step on my foot, and you'll find yourself in the home place. So this kind of dream of teleportation, being in another place, was something that many dreamt during the siege of Sarajevo in the 90s. Um, so that's a reference to that. This is. Um, Two birds in the same nest, a story of a village uh, that of Ahmedchi where 116 inhabitants were killed in one day by their Croat neighbors in this case. Um, after the destruction and the kind of torture was so heavy that when the community came back, they didn't know how to deal with the trauma, whether to restore the mosques the same way as they were, to erect a monument. So they fell apart, and so there are now two mosques, and they kind of, for a while, didn't talk to each other. Um, so there was uh, this kind of dilemma of how to deal with traumatic memory. 
This one talks about difficulties of coexistence and return. This is in eastern Bosnia, uh, in Zvornik, uh, bird with the pigs, Probosix. Um, this is the only mosque that uh, the community managed to restore after they came back. But to signal them that they are not welcome home, someone threw them a slaughtered pig into the foundations of the mosque, indicating um, you, know, no, you are not welcome, you are not supposed to uh, uh, restore this place. And pig being an uh, impure animal in Islamic uh, context signals uh, the kind of impurity of the place and, and humiliates the site. And then finally, the, another aspect here of arts agency is that the process of making can be a response to trauma recovery. In this case, uh, the carpet was woven by women who are employed as weavers as a form of trauma recovery. So weaving is a process of, of, of healing. And at the end of uh, the exhibition, I. Uh, uh, had the pos possibility to invite the judges and those who are involved into the courts in uh, uh, criminal tribunal in The Hague to launch this project as a monument by hanging ritually uh, prayer beads that I collected uh, during my field trip, uh, kind of kneeling down in front of the monument, in front of that story and, and acknowledging it. Now to the problem of xenophobia in Europe. Um, some of these discussions are unfortunately filtering here uh, with Donald Trump's uh, recent call to expel Muslims. Um, I've been documenting and working with this uh, topic in Western Europe for some time. Um, uh, the presence of Muslims and visibility of Islamic culture in Europe has been kind of place of contestation for several decades, even though um, you know, Islamic uh, religious architecture and heritage has been part of European cultural heritage for, uh, you know, since the ninth century at least. And uh, many of these discussions when you know, new mosques are being built, you are, uh, the immigrant communities are often faced with this kind of protests uh, which uh, deny the, the architecture of these migrant communities is something that's alien to the local place. Right? The mosques uh, don't belong to uh, supposedly Judeo-Christian um, culture of, of Europe, which of course historically cannot be sustained. But the other part of the discussion that is architectural, where architects and designers are responding is with this kind of also quite reductive debate of you know we should not be building and being inspired by these historical forms because again they are kind of transplanted from uh, Ottoman Empire or from another historical period without any uh, negotiation with the context to um, and favoring the white cube uh, as something that is maybe more belonging to Europe. This uh, kind of dichotomy for me is very uh, reductive because it uh, reduces the historical uh, heterogeneity of forms that are available to our repertoire of Islamic religious architecture. Um, and uh, generally, these whole discussions uh, show us that the idea of how people perceive their own identity and both the migrants and, and the dominant societies is quite a reductive one, as if um, you know, culture and tradition is something that is stiff, that is not allowed to change and uh, kind of move and develop in dialogue um, with other cultures. And here I would like to argue that Islamic um, cultural heritage has always had this dialogic dimension which we can foster and kind of get inspiration back from the history um, to inform the design of contemporary forms. This is what I'm doing as an artist, for example. I have this series of what I call wearable mosques. This is one example of it. Um, it's a seemingly traditional Austrian uh, costume, diendel, you know, the equivalent of the lederhosen uh, for men. And here the apron opens up and becomes a prayer rug for three people. The traditional shoulder scarf becomes a scarf uh, to cover your hair for the ritual worship. The piece is, is designed, inspired uh, from a local site in Austria uh, by the Catholic altar of uh, Church of St. Wolfgang, and uh, which opens into three uh, parts, but also uh, you know, this kind of mini mosque allows you to uh, open up a space uh, and transform any space into a kind of 
Islamic and hybrid, culturally hybrid environment, and it showed that fluidity of identity that uh, you know we one can change, and there is a, a aspect of dialogue that one can embrace into own culture. Um, I have pushed these ideas to another dimension in the recently uh, accomplished project uh, called um, Islamic Cemetery Altach. Uh, this was the first cemetery in this region of Western Austria where you have a large migrant community of Muslims from Turkey, Bosnia, and Chechnya, and also some North African countries who uh, for the first time have decided that they want to bury their dead in their new home in Austria. Uh, and for this, they needed a, a cemetery. But what that meant uh, is not very clear. And, uh, I was invited by the architect Bernardo Bader, who designed the cemetery, to design the prayer space for it. Um, in this case, what was significant is that a new aesthetic needed to be found for this new idea of homeland. That homeland is not anymore a place where you came from, but the place where you want to bury your dead. Um, so I worked uh, with the idea of creating a space that would um, speak simultaneously to several cultures and, and make them feel at home. You have uh, the prayer space works with the is, is importance of light in Islamic um, art and architecture, light being one of the names of God. Um, you have the Qibla wall, which is the wall indicating direction of Mecca. Uh, the closest ones towards Mecca. It carries the inscriptions in calligraphy saying Allah uh, and Muhammad uh, three times with means of uh, these shingles, wooden shingles that are creating reference to the local architecture, but also to some contemporary architectural designs. This is a grand mosque in Ankara of the National Assembly, where also inspired by Christian architecture, uh, a beautiful mihrab, this place of presence of absence of the prophet, indicating the prayer direction, has been designed literally through light, uh, through a glass window. Uh, so this is what I've done here, using these shingles to stage the light to, you know, um, to symbolize, uh, create uh, emphasis on this uh, very significant spot, but also to kind of create animated um, experience of space. So when you enter from here, you are moving, uh, the space is kind of animated as you're looking towards this curtain because the shingles seem to be moving through your movement. When you stand still uh, and you know in the prayer position, um, the view calms down and you can see through to the garden, which is outside of it, um, and it symbolizes also to kind of the world after. And what was very interesting here um, is this piece got the Aga Khan Award for Architecture was acknowledged in both Islamic and non-Islamic contexts because it really brought the aesthetic of two different communities together. On the one hand, um, the immigrant Muslim community, which, you know, there are people from different parts of the world. You cannot bring something only Bosnian or something Turkish or something Chechen. And Austrians who are recognizing themselves in the design and are coming now to see and learn more about Islamic culture. So. Um, Primarily, this whole project functions as a kind of educational platform for uh, both cultures. At the same time, a new law had to be invented to facilitate the burial according to Islamic right. Uh, this was not possible up to this point. So there was a lot of uh, kind of um, social and legal processes involved to actually make this space and this uh, ritual possible. And this is also one of the ways in which art and architecture can kind of literally transform society. Now, um, other way I'm working against xenophobia is with trying to uh, test out new forms of cultural mobility. Um, this is a project called Culture Runners that I initiated with an uh, organization called Edge of Arabia, uh, London-based, uh, organizing a symposia and literal movement of artists and uh, scientists across contested cultural territories. This was a symposium, storytelling symposium I organized at MIT with them uh, last fall, in which we invited uh, artists from the Middle East and the US 
to share uh, stories of cultural encounters, but also sh share their technologies. So here, for example, you could uh, drink tea with a human avatar, a student from MIT, who uh, is connected with headphones and uh, with a curator in Tehran. And so this was a visitor of a symposium, so you would kind of speak to the guy in Tehran, but through that person. He could hear you, but you could not hear him. So there was an aspect of technology, but also embodiment that was important. Uh, people sharing stories from different cultures, and then also technologies being showcasted and tested. In this case, Orkan Telhan, uh, a colleague from Media Lab, uh, who designed these uh, discursive readers of Quran and Torah and Bible. Uh, as you are reading from one holy text, you get all these other texts pulled into it. Um, and this was a project that I developed within this larger umbrella. Yarn de Vu is a growing cultural fabric designed to map the identities, migration, and cultural encounters of its participants. This wearable quilt features textiles from Islamic cultures and local sites in the United States. Hexagons and stars of the quilt can be transformed into individual letterman's jackets and vice versa. The jackets unzip flat into geometric elements that form the larger quilt. Yarndevous began with Culture Runners, an artistic expedition in search of empathy between cultures. This expedition takes shape through journeys of artists in an American RV, modified with artworks and broadcast technologies to function as a vehicle for intercultural communication. Like the At the heart of this expedition is the development of new cultural technologies. For example, wearable what and portable communication devices such as Yandevu that can connect communities across contested cultural territories, especially the Middle East and United States. Yarn de Vu. The project name is a hybrid of the words yarn and rendezvous. Yarn refers to a thread used for making fabrics and to storytelling. Yarn can also mean an exciting story. Rendezvous refers to a place for a meeting or a romance. Yarn de Vu is meant to connect people and their stories through their cultural patterns, symbols, and textiles. Through Yarn de Vu, people can discover stories that they share and communicate unofficial, interconnected histories. In the fall of 2014, the Culture Runners Symposium at MIT asked participating artists to bring textiles from the places of their residence, which were then combined with textiles from Boston. The first phase of the project encompasses 12 jackets completed with these hybrid textiles. The project is in the state of an ongoing transformation and customization. Some jackets may be further transformed into variations on tunics, caftans, abayas, dresses, and shirts inspired from East and West. Over time, as more and more textiles are collected from project participants, the Yarn de Vu will change its color and patterns, becoming a map of the growing Culture Runners community. Oh, wow. 
So this is quite an uh, interactive piece. I mean, it functions as a piece of fashion, but also, you know, it's a performative device. So I hang it like this, and here in the symposium, we kind of ended the symposium with people like you stuck your head through, and then you kind of unwrap the thing around the people and, and, and launch a, a group building through it. Um, and the Culture Runners project is still running across US, is now um, organized by Edge of Arabia, uh, different residencies, but it was very interesting the kinds of um, people and communities that it inv involved, uh, ranging from you know the guy in Texas who burned the Quran to uh, here the uh, Saudi ambassador to the United Nations and to the uh, cultural commissioner in, in New York. So this little bus is really a place to kind of bring people together and also facilitate the communication in a, in a different way. And finally, I'm coming to the third part, uh, is the global threats to heritage um, and, a, and a ways in which we can foster uh, solidarity through empathy using cultural heritage. Um, a couple of years ago, the National Museum of Bosnia shut down. Um, here is a moment of you know, demonstrators, students uh, protesting the closing of the, uh, of the museum, which shut down supposedly for budgetary reasons, but actually for political reasons. Um, the director of the museum nailed down the doors of the museum as if he's expecting a tornado. And um, this closure marked also the acute crisis of um, seven other state-level institutions, which um, you know had budgetary and political problems because half of the country in Bosnia is saying, "Well, you know, we don't want to be together in the same country. This is not our heritage. This is not our history." And the others are saying, well, yes, this is our history. We are one state. We need to have state institutions. So the discrepancy over who wants to be together and who not uh, is affecting the status of state-level institutions, because they are symbols of the states. They are keepers of memory. Um, and uh, this is their role. And they are framing that memory as a kind of as a collective unit. Um, and precisely for that reason, you have a fraction in Bosnian politics undermining the existence of the museum. Uh, so this happened first time for 125 years of the existence of the museum. Um, in response to that crisis, I organized uh, this platform uh, called Culture Shutdown, uh, together with a number of museologists, curators, <coughs> historians, bibliographers from different countries who are concerned with the culture um, in uh, the Balkans, but also people working in uh, the museum context in general who were concerned with this. Um, and within that, everyone was doing you know, what they could. We performed some form of international cultural lobbying. Uh, as an artist, I uh, went back to you know, knowing the power of the image, what the image can do, and how you can kind of use it for um, global solidarity action. So in 2013, I organized this Solidarity Day, raising awareness about this crisis. Um, and asking museums and galleries across the world to sign up on our website. Um, and I'll send them the culture shutdown tape. And they cross out one artifact in their collection, like the doors of the museum in Sarajevo, and send the picture. And so this um, action went global and viral with the support of ECOM and CIMAM, the major international uh, museum organizations, but also uh, you know, through viral, through uh, friendship networks and people uh, of diaspora who cared. Um, over 300 uh, institutions participated, ranging from major museums like the German Historical Museum to contemporary art uh, museums to um, also art galleries, uh, universities, but also, you know, people wrapping themselves in tape and individuals who just went somewhere and, and participated. I just love this little shark. <laughs> what was very important is local institutions, so countries with which Bosnia was in war with, like Croatia and, and Serbia, also participated because their museums are in similar crisis and cultural workers in these uh, places recognize uh, the point of you know, 
preserving that memory of, of our common existence. And, and there were also moments like this. So it was beautiful as these uh, you know, hundreds of images were securing in to see what the value of heritage. And, and for me, it was very interesting to th start thinking about, well, why would someone in Japan or Australia care about some museum in Bosnia? And uh, what it meant was really that there are global threats to heritage. Uh, museums and cultural workers are uh, put under pressure for different reasons in different places, having to justify their existence, whether it's what is the role of a national museum in a post-national world, to budgetary or political issues and issues of human rights uh, that we are facing in, in different places where some people are not given voice and not given their museum. Uh, for me personally in the region, and, you know, having organizations from Serbia and um, Croatia participating and having that support was very important signal to the local nationalists. Here you see image of the, our former uh, President Tito from the time when Yugoslavia was still intact and, and uh, having the idea of solidarity across the ethnic groups. After the, uh, this action, I uh, printed banners of this action and uh, they are still posterized on the facades of the, of the threatened institutions and you know, for a couple of years they were standing there. The project went on to different places where you know, I work with galleries to also reflect on their local problems. So this was in Ljubljana, kind of barricading the entrance to the museum. Uh, it's a sound sculpture as you're walking in, you're hearing uh, voices from the museums. And then also expanding to larger questions of what is heritage and whose heritage are we talking about. So this is a piece I call Future Heritage Collection, where I stage myself as uh, an archaeologist coming from the future. Uh, and there are 10 questions. I'll just show you some. Uh, I wear literally different hats. Uh, and all of these questions are based on the actual examples from um, from the world, so I'm, I'm asking contemporary citizens of the world to reflect and think about uh, heritage. Dear citizen of the world, a hundred years from your present, humankind has finally established contact with another planet. Humans are about to send a spacecraft with documentation about heritage representing or embodying the cultural memory of our world. Through time travel, I have arrived to include your voice in this selection process. As the Earth's representative inhabitant, you have the right to select one example of cultural heritage. Can you tell me what would you pick and why? Please send me your proposal by sending out this card. Thank you. Dear citizen of the world, your government is about to launch a nation branding campaign by inviting citizens to discuss their national heritage. The government plans to create a Twitter account named at heritage of my country, curated weekly by a randomly chosen citizen. The goal of this rotating curatorship is to improve the image of your country through definitions of heritage that are literally controlled by its citizens. You will be in charge of this account for one week. What example of heritage would you choose in order to improve your country and why? Please help your government by filling out this card. Thank you. Dear citizen of the world, I'm writing to you from the year 2500, having discovered the image title Ecce Mono or Potato Jesus created by the artist Cecilia Jimenez in 2012. This depiction of Jesus in the Sanctuary of Mercy Church in Borja, Zaragoza, is now recognized as one of the early 21st century's artistic masterpieces. In my research, I discovered that during her time, Cecilia Jimenez was known for this work as a failed restoration of the 1930s painting by Elias Garcia Martinez. My past, or your present media correspondent, mocked and found humor in this elderly amateur artist who transformed Jesus' fresco into 
quote, crayon sketch of a very hairy monkey in ill-fitting tunic. I would be very grateful if you could help me understand who in your present time is or should be permitted to preserve heritage and based on what criteria. Thank you. Okay, so the person referred to in this last uh, image is, this is Cecilia Gimenez, and this is the painting that she transformed. And so in each of these uh, uh, postcards from the future, I'm referring to one example. In this case, you know, this is Cecilia, she's a painter, it's her church. The fresco was damaged, she went in there and she painted and restored it. And then this became a meme and went viral and this poor woman was uh, you know, mocked and laughed about in the whole world. So I'm saying, okay, what if you know, at some point we put our, our whole idea of uh, you know, who is an expert and what is the expertise in restoration upside down in the future? Maybe in that context she would become, so to say, a world's famous artist. Um, and so this uh, kind of future archaeologist is inviting people to participate in the process and think about what are the criteria that define heritage, what is the kind of access to heritage and, and prevention uh, to that access in your context, um, and, and to ask you a question about that, and then people can participate in various ways. One iteration of that was in Sarajevo, where I invited citizens whose museum was shut down to come and become curators of their own heritage and bring artifacts that uh, they were, you know, not at display in the museum. So in that process, you were able to see both um, the way a collection is made, things are documented, how are they written down, where is the source coming from uh, to learn about the, uh, the museum process. And it was very also interesting, the kinds of stories that people brought. They were invited also to write little stories about them from you know, artifacts. This came from a Serbian um, a citizen of Sarajevo who, um, you know, this is a kind of piece of textile that very much looks like an Islamic uh, cultural heritage, but it's in Serbian Orthodox tradition, also something that's used as a wedding um, band um, that she used for her wedding, and it was a piece of kind of transcultural heritage that she wanted to bring in because that's not considered as well, pure, you know, kind of nationalist ideas of, of uh, Bosnian heritage to um, those artifacts that are not yet considered heritage, like the socialist period uh, and the awesome design happening at that time, but now also not fitting the contemporary nationalist uh, elites uh, ideas of what is valuable to be preserved for the past. To kind of media archeology span and this, uh, you know, um, photo, um, camera that uh, the photographer of the project brought and he's someone who survived the shooting. He comes from Eastern Bosnia and he with his father was lined up to be shot in um, uh, on a kind of nearby lake and they saved themselves by throwing themselves into a uh, nearby lake. Years after he becomes an artist, the lake dries out mass grave in which he and his father was supposed to be buried, uh, dry out, and he goes as an artist to document that with his camera. So there's this dimension of, you know, like uh, incredible survivor's story, plus the thing itself, if you don't know the story, being a valuable piece of uh, kind of human technology uh, that is also being superseded with new digital technologies. And then these kinds of artifacts are uh, transformed into postcards and posters that are then exhibited in, in the city. Uh, and finally, the restorative memory is an issue I've been working on. You know, how do we really approach the past and reconstruct it in the context of global threats to heritage and, and um, kind of thinking about the future, what are we leaving for the future generations? So this is a project that is a kind of culmination of the, all the other thoughts that you saw before uh, called Memory Matrix, uh, which I produced or started to produce this semester um, at MIT. This is uh, the media lab at MIT in the, uh, my office is somewhere right here. And um, in this arch that is kind of our triumphal arch of the campus um, for the 100th anniversary of the old campus, I uh, proposed an installation that would be a kind of physical slash digital display 
of the Arch of Triumph of Palmyra that was destroyed by ISIL uh, last year. Um, this uh, very important monument was one of the most significant uh, monuments uh, uh, from the Palmyra, but also you know, really important example like that whole city um, of transcultural heritage where East and West met and where civilizations have learned from one another. So it's also a kind of story embodied in this monument and also the whole media spectacle that we all embraced uh, as the monument was destroyed by ISIL. So given the fact that most of the artifacts that are currently being looted and destroyed in Syria are now only existing in digital form, I wanted to translate them uh, in, into the digital effect and um, uh, translated this monument into, on the one hand, a kind of physical monument that creates a display with uh, physical means, the green symbolizing uh, the green of the display. But it's a scaffolding, it's a kind of monument in the making, um, made of symbolic materials. So when you zoom out from the far, you see outlines of the um, uh, Palmyra arch in different layers of, uh, of the scaffolding, uh, carried by chain link fencing. And when you zoom in, you see 20,000 little pixels uh, that are uh, punched with holes, laser cut, with outlines of artifacts destroyed in different parts of the world. Um, so literal absence of these monuments in landscape is represented in the absence of the plexiglass. So this is the piece, for example, I can maybe circulate some of these. Uh, you see here is how most of those uh, look like that were hung in installation. And here is a more intricate form of it that a student of mine did with uh, ornaments from Palmyra, so that you can circulate. Um, so you see the way these uh, are designed. So there is a code here. There is a, a, a literal absence of the artifact and a little Bitcoin um, element from the far you get an animated view. This is how the installation looks at night. Uh, this plexiglass radiates at night. And when, you, when we turn um, um, a black light on, it really like pops out like a digital display. As you are moving, you discover the different, similar like the Islamic cemetery uh, project. Your view is animated both by the wind and light, but also by your own movement around it. So as, as you are walking, you see that this is an anamorphic image uh, changing as you are moving. Then you see that it's actually projected on several layer of fencing. And then the light also changes. So at some point, it turns green, and the whole thing disappears. All materials used are symbolic. So here, we use the chain link fencing to reference the borders being erected against Syrian refugees all across the world. Um, the border is then multiplied in several layers, becoming a gate that you can pass through and engage and be in this display and uh, kind of experience the monument and the artifact. These little designs in, of the pixels are um, created through workshops that are taking place in different parts of the world. So, you know, the first one started at MIT with my students, and then um, there was another one at the Cairo Mecca Fair. Uh, where hundreds of people were participating. Uh, there will be another one coming up in Ramallah. Then I'm going to um, uh, Amman in Jordan, where I will be working with Syrian refugees. The stories uh, that um, depicted are really beautiful and open up really this question of global threats to heritage. So from uh, the synagogue in Munich, uh, proposed by one of my students whose family survived the Holocaust to uh, you know, the book burning, to uh, monuments destroyed in, um, in earthquake, to the indigenous knowledge and uh, you know, disappearing with our takeover of rainforest. Um, so uh, you know, these kinds of stories are get enriched and open up like global concerns as we are moving to different sites. Um, then when you look into the detail of each pixel, 
Here is a code that tells where the thing was produced. And here uh, is a Bitcoin chain link. The individual pixel is also a physical keychain that links to the digital keychain of information when you are entering Bitcoin transactions. Um, you are entering a number of uh, data that is, um, you know, entering hundreds of charts digitally. So after this project is done, you know, the data about this project will be actually made indestructible and will be circulating in internet forever. And um, this idea of cryptographic heritage and Bitcoin chain link um, linking is something that my husband Dietmar often Huber is developing within this project, but also beyond that. And I'm personally very excited about this because this can, this is also something that um, communities threatened by war uh, can actually then use to preserve their heritage digitally uh, from being destroyed. And once you click on the link of the website, you get to one of these you know, hundreds of websites in which uh, store traces of information linked to these um, Bitcoin uh, chain link on the pixels. The interior, the inside of the pixel becomes a piece of jewelry that we will be selling and also embodiment um, that is meant to um, subsidize some of the workshops with Syrian refugees. And then, you know, at MIT, this was really a solidarity building enterprise. Over 140 people made this project together possible. Um, it was from my students to different department heads and, you know, pulling together financially, but also in terms of content. Um, incredible amount of collaborative uh, and um, effort. And, you know, I'm hoping to take this experience further. So the uh, thinking about restoration and what exactly is the kind of spectacle of reconstruction instead of, you know, using technology to restore the shape of the arch. It's translating the arch into this kind of solidarity building and educational experience which um, is also temporary, you know, see some, you know, as the wind was blowing, we had crazy uh, weather happening in April in Boston. Half of the installation was destroyed, and it was really beautiful also how, like, the whole monument shed itself, ultimately starting to look like the piece as it was destroyed by ISIS. Uh, so this kind of destruction, you know, happens inevitably. The next station is then really going to the Middle East and using this project to uh, share some of the knowledge with um, students and communities that don't have access neither to their heritage anymore, but also to opportunities that we have here. Okay, I'll stop here and open up for questions. Thank you very much.